Hello everybody, I am Welsh Necro as you all know, and we are back to finish the fifth chapter of Vlad the Impaler. Now let's continue. Uh, your weapon clangs sharply against the sword of the bearded knight. A, shing a shingle gives away under your foot and you barely manage to adjust your weight before you slide off the roof to certain death. The knight presses his attack and you're forced backwards along the door of the Haga Safa Marquis. Your name will be added to the list of the judges, shouted the knight. You will join your heathen brothers and sisters impaled on the pikes of hell, and your and your sultan will at last feel the fires of the master he serves. With that you duck a swing of his sword and spin to strike him hard against the ribcage. The armor under his cloaks keeps him from being hurt, but the force of the blow sends him creening off the roof. With a frightening scream, he plummets to the street below. His armor, his armored body skewers himself on the spikes of the monkweed fence. As you look down at his broken body, quickly soaking to red, you realize that what his final words were ported? They are going to assassinate the Sultan. Oh wow, ooh. Man, I like these scenes, they are quite amazing. So now I have three turns left. I better make them good. Okay, so... But the Sultan, shouldn't I go to the palace? Because I believe they are people of high importance, maybe? You gain entrance to the palace on the final day of Ramadan, where there is t to be an extormous, enormous feast to break the mouth of fasting, the month of fasting. While well, there, you manage to sneak off into the shadows in order to investigate some suspicions you have about the Sultan's advisors. As you are passing the extensive kitchens, one of the cooks happens to make eye contact with you. My friend, he says, you look at him cautiously before realizing that he is the father of a child you rescued from kidnappers. He comes up to you and shakes your hand profusely. Not a day goes by that I do not thank God for you and my prayers. You smile at him, hoping to end the conversation before anyone else takes notice of you. Please, he says, leading you into the kitchen. I have no money to offer, but I can give you something which is better than money. He pulls you over to a cauldron of simmering stew and adults and dolts out a small bowl for you. This brew is made only for the Sultan. It is a special soup which he takes every night before bed. It has magical properties. Just this once between you and I, I offer to you as thanks for rescuing my child. Um, I'm going to try because maybe it is good. This could actually be poison, so maybe I might die. I will accept the suit and drink it. Thank you. Thank you, you say and taste it. The broth is strong and full of spice, but it is very good. As you drink it, you ask the man why it is so special. It strengthens vital vitality so that the Sultan can keep his wives and concubines happy in bed. Oh dear god, I just drank Viagra. <laughs> oh god. That was not the answer you expected, but certainly a little more vitality can never hurt. <laughs> oh god. Tricking me into drinking an aphrodisiac. Thank you very much, you reply, handing the bowl back to him. It's the least I can do, he replies. Thank you for bringing back my son. You shake his hand, then leave the kitchen, continuing on your way. You do notice that you feel somewhat stronger than you did when you entered. You feel a sense of confidence and a certain level of prowls. What was in that bowl was certainly powerful. So I got plus one strength. Hmm. 
So I went to the palace. I didn't really find anything. I gained one strength. Maybe I'll go here. Mm. One second. You wander through the Grand Basilisk, listening to the morning prayers of the devoted. In the back of the church, you notice a nondescriptive door with three separate locks. You wonder to yourself what the priest of Istanbul could possibly need to keep so secure, however. However, if your years of experience have taught you anything, it's that the best answer can be found behind the most heavily locked doors. Mm, excuse me. You check for witnesses and then commence picking the locks. Surprisingly, the first two yield quickly. The third one takes its time, however, but you manage to get it open just as you hear footsteps coming down the hall toward you. You open the door and slip inside, closing it quietly behind you. You find yourself in a tight stairwell spiraling upwards. Climbing several stories, you emerge into a small shrine. It is empty aside from a single podium with a closed book on it and a large effing, effing of Christ on the cross hanging on the far wall. You walk up to the book. Burned into the leather cover are the words, The Gospel of, Me of Mena? Of Masterma? Masterma? It's strange you don't remember an Apollos name, Mastema. You are about to open the book when you realize that something else in the room isn't right. A chill run down your spine when you finally notice that the Jesus is blindfold on the cross. I'm gonna have to open the book and read it. You crack the book open and begin to read. The words are dark, and the imagery is monstrous. The, re the revelations are horrifying. You don't fully come back to sane consciousness until much later that night, when you find yourself shivering and screaming in a refused pile of several neighborhoods away. Your hands are covered in blood, and claw marks crisscross your face. Later, after you snuck back into your hotel room, you find a single long blonde hair stuck between your teeth. Oh, Jesus Christ, what did I do? Yeah, I guess I wasn't smart in a way. Okay. Time for the final ending. The last... Ch um, the last turn of my go as the high priestess or something like that. Since the catacombs have having turned out good for me for the first two times, I'm gonna try on my last turn, for my last try to see if it will turn out good for me. On your way through the catacombs, you notice one skeleton, in particular pointing off down a specific row of graves. You wonder if perhaps it is a directional marker for some underground cult, and follow in the direction it points. After a little walking, you come to another skeleton, pop, propped up in its coffin and pointing in another direction. You follow that as well as the direction of four others, as the direction of four others until you come to a door, a door made entirely of bones. There is a lock, perhaps requiring a skeleton key. But there is also a small metal bowl with a spike rising out of it. An inscription above the bowl reads, Blood for Bones. I feel like I can't pick the lock, but I feel like that could be put. So I might have to try to pick the lock. You slide your tools into the lock, the lock and begin to test its mechanical when a trapdoor suddenly opens underneath you, your reflexes save you as you grab the bone door before completely falling into the hole. Your torch, however, drops to the bottom. Oh, whoops. Drops to the bottom, where you see that... Where you see that there have been others who tried to jimmy the door. 
they are impaled on a metal spike having learned too late that the lock was merely a, a trap to catch thieves. You pull yourself out of the hole, recomposing yourself and trying and try pricking your finger on the spike instead. Unfortunately, the door seems to have bolted itself in the inside after you tried the lock. You have returned later after it resets. Oh, really? Is that it? Oh, that kind of sucks. Oh, well, I got one agility, one strength, minus one dexterity, one constitution, two intelligence. Oh, that kind of sucks. Well, anyway, let's find out how this turned out. Oh, there's a chapter six. Sultan Mehem, Memd, the second, is just sitting down into the waters of the palace grand bath when one of the maidens, maidens attending him loops a length of silver cord around his throat. You leap from behind the travis tapestry where you were hiding and slice the assassin's head off in one stroke. Ooh. The Sultan gasps for air as he splashes away the other royal ba bathers screaming in horror as the deadly woman's body pitches forward, bounding blood into the pr pristine water. What is the meaning of all this? The sultan the sun, the cries. You will lean forward and pick the woman's head, turning it around to show a tattoo on the back of her neck. They're called the Ismenjuli? It means dragon in Roham. The sudden's face turns from red to white as he sees the symbols of the many-headed dragon on her neck. He then finishes fishes the assassin's cord out of the water to find a silver dragon cross dangling from the end of it. The Order of the Dragon. Yes, your majesty, you replied. They are the force behind the bloodshed in Istanbul. I have learned through my investigations that they have been waging a bloody inquisition across your city, torturing and killing anyone they perceive to be evil, and in doing so they have dis uh, discreet into a darkness greater than that which they sought to purge. The Sultan looks up at you. The Order of the Dragon does not move without the command of their secret master. You nod, placing the se severed head into a silver plate, and whose that master is, and whoever that master is would have the weight of all of this bloodshed on his hand. The Sultan gazes up at you, indeed, becoming the greatest of all monsters, and I know the name of that man, for I have faced him before. He's Vlad, Dracula, Prince of Watching? It is so wrong. And that was really bad. Uh, and known as the Impaler. You reply, finishing the Sultan's sentence. You know of him? You nod sadly. He is the one who asked me to come here searching for a great evil. The same as his knight. The Sultan. Chatterty guards finally swarm the room and a dozen spears are pointed in your direction. Hold, shouts Sultan Mahem. This is a hero. More than that, a hero with one last task to complete. The Sultan turns back to you. For, for unless I miss my guess, you are the type of person who finishes what they began. It is with a heavy head that you nod because he's right. So do I actually finish? Do I go and try to kill him now? Okay, let's find out. The Sultan leaves the room for a moment, stepping into the shadows. He returns carrying an item that he holds with great esteem and presents it to you. My sorcery, my sorcerers have told me of your magic. The Sultan states, take this and allow its power to guide you. Just a glance at the staff inspires fate and within, from within. Although fits for a king... Although fit for a king, its true power is a waste in my heavy hands. 
So because my magic was so high, it was the highest, it so I get a staff. I'm assuming that's how it works. And so I get plus one intelligent and one magic. Journey to castle. You leave behind a city still in the grip of darkness, despite all you have done in it on its streets and its shadowy corners, there is only one way to truly save it. Your trek across Ottoman Ottoman country is a Doris. By day bandits hound you as if having specially given been given your name. At night things crawl out of the shadows with teeth like knives, only to be kept at bay by this circuits you have drawn upon the ground around you. It is harrowing harrowing and you sleep little, but as you climb through the mountainous forest of Transylvania, at last you find the road you once climbed as a friend. And even in the twisting twilight landscape, there are still a few flowers to be seen along the road. You pick a few that catch the last light of the warm, the warning sun, but as the round, but as you round the final bend, Vlad's castle comes into view. You once stayed there as a welcome friend. Now it seems to stare at you in hunger, as if the very stones, one second, as if the very stones were luring you into the grasping mouth of the inner gates. Oh, I'm an unwelcome visitor. <laughs> uh, the portress crashed down behind you, and as you enter the dead walls, you know for a fact that there is now only one way you'll ever leave Castle Dracula, and death is not it. Oh, this is cool. This is cool as hell. The an Anathek chambers? The front gates to the castle swing wide, as if operate operated by phantoms. You know that to show any fear would be fatal, so you squeeze your jaw, draw your weapon, and step across the threshold. The main anchorage is dark, but just as your eyes are beginning to adjust, a hundred candles flare to life. Cobwebs crisscross the high ceiling, but you still make out the mural painted there, a sweeping description of Vlad as a younger man, leading his forces of Wallachine soldiers against the vast armies of the Sultan. You remember how much he looked like a savior in that painting when sunlight would fill the dome, but now by flickering candlelight he appears more like a horseman of the apocalypse. Who goes there? comes a voice from the balcony above you. You look up to find a rugged looking man with a full beard and a dark eye. And dark eyes staring down at you. I've come to see Prince Vlad, you say. Mm. I'm a friend, and I suspect him. I suspect he's been expecting me. The man's mouth twisted up into a smile. He has expecting you to die. The man leaps, then leaps over the railing, but when he hits the floor, it it is on all fours, and it's the shape of an enormous werewolf. With a frightening growl, he charges you. Um, I think the best thing would be to attack. Showing no fear, you leap towards, lunging with your weapon to stab straight through the wolf's gaping mouth. It makes a sickening squishing sound as it lodges down the beast's throat. But the sheer force of the creature's momentum knocks you two, knocks the two of you over, sending you collapsing to the stone floor. 
the werewolf thrashes in plain in pain trying to remove itself from your weapon but you are relentless relentless and twist it with all your might to impale the creature through the brain the fury mo the fury monster goes limp on top of you you roll you roll it off and climb back to your feet your clothes have been torn and deep cuts begin to ooze blood from where the werewolf's talons raked through your flesh fear begins to seep into your veins a scratch from a werewolf's claw has the chance of infecting you with its curse and now your blood is beginning to flow the scent of which is undoubtedly attracted other uh, denizens in the castle frustrated and in pain you plant a solid boot on the werewolf's flank and yank your weapon from his mangled jaws. It isn't turning back into its human shape. Clearly it isn't dead and in time will resurrect. Your plan on, e on either not being around for that. You plan on either not being around for that or carrying silver when it happens. So you move on deeper into the castle. Oh, I got one. Okay, so I guess I have to go for that room and then maybe that one right there. Alright, I guess it's time for the Black Chapel. As you enter the castle chapel, you are surprised to see just how greatly it has fallen into despair. It wasn't more than ten years ago that you attended mass in this very place and yet it looks as though centuries have passed. The pewds have spit and warped. The arl is, has overgrown with liches. The crucifix has been shattered. Dust and ash cover everything. Most disturbingly, however, is that the tombs of the other long-dead Dracula seems to have been recently opened. You cross the chapel, past the bat baptist front where Vlad himself was baptized as a child. And you wonder just how this great man could have fallen so far that when you realize there is a... <sighs> man, just reading this makes me sleepy. When you realize that there is a woman standing against the far wall. You had noticed her when you entered because her dress is gray and her face is covered with the same ash as the rest of the chapel. She stares at you with unblinking eyes. I'm going to speak to her. What are you doing down here, you ask. Her voice is little more than a whisper as she replies, I was married here. You take a deep step. You take a step towards her. You're one of the Draculas, you say? She slowly shakes her head. No. Are you dead, you ask? She blinks for the first time. Single tears run down either side of her face, washing away ribbons of ash. Then she nods. You take a step closer. Did he kill you? She shakes her head. No. Are you one of his guardians, you ask? She closes her eyes, but then, then she slowly nods. Her voice is even quieter when she replies, But I have failed. How have you failed, you asked. Mere feet away from her, flesh tears. Fresh tears run down her cheeks, as she says, Because I was guarding his conscience. That stopped her, his conscience? Uh, that stops you in your tracks. What happened to him, you ask? Her eyes slowly... Ugh, god damn it. I gotta stop you on him. Her eyes slowly open as she looks at you from the deep shadows of her face. He sought to do good deeds. He intended for the Knights of the Dragon to help the innocent to combat evil. 
but they have gone astray, persecuting everyone they come across. Mm. And the blood of their hands has twisted him, opened his heart to the influence of shadow and night, and he no longer listens to me, only the howling of wolves and the mewing of his cold woman. He is lost. Her eyes wander down to your weapon. Now there is one last thing which can affect his heart, she reaches. She reaches a filthy finger to touch your weapon. There is a sudden flash of light blinding you. You step back, rubbing your eyes. When the effects of the light finally subdue, you are alone again in the chapel. Your weapon, however, seems different, almost as if we're shinier, lumicating in the black chapel. You remember the werewolf and press on to the black to the back staircase, climbing to the heights of the castle. Oh, so I didn't gain anything. Um, I'm gonna end that here for today, or not not for today, but I'm gonna end this one here because I it's surprisingly longer than I thought. So I'm gonna end this episode here. Um, thanks for watching. Uh, like and subscribe if you want. Oh man, reading this story makes me want to sleep. <sighs> I hope you're enjoying the series. I want to thank everybody for watching, and hopefully in the next episode we can end this. So, until the next episode, goodbye.